Hello everyone. This is the fourth history tutorial video for class eight. The chapter is from trade to territory. We were continuing this chapter from the previous video. Now, the first English factory, the first factory of the English East India Company, was set up on the banks of the river Hooghly in 1651. This was the base from which the company's traders operated. The factory had a warehouse where the goods were uh, stored. and it had offices where company officials sat as trade expanded the company persuaded merchants and traders to come and settle near the factory by 1696 it began building a fort around the settlement two years later it bribed the mughal officials into giving the company zamindari rights over three villages one of these were kalikata which later grew into the city of calcutta and then kolkata it is also persuaded the mughal emperor aurangzeb the company made the mughal emperor aurangzeb to issue a farman granting the company the right to trade without any duty without any tax so the company made aurangzeb sign a treaty sign a farman which ordered that Henceforth the English East India Company do not have to pay any tax for uh, for the trade to the Mughal Empire Aurangzeb's farman gave the company a lot of advantages but the company wasn't satisfied they wanted more advantages they wanted more privileges Aurangzeb's farman had granted only the company the right to trade without taxes but officials of the company who were carrying on private trade on the side they were expected to pay taxes this they refused to pay causing an enormous loss of revenue for bengal now after aurangzeb's death this malpractice became the normal thing now the nawab of uh, bengal sirajuddaula he protested against this malpractice he also had a number of complaints that uh, the company is undermining his authority the company is not paying their taxes and uh, the company is violating the rule of the land that is only the nawab or the king can build forts they are violating this rule and they are building their own forts in calcutta which which uh, the which is known as fort william so thus a face off between the bengal nawab and the company was just a matter of time now sirajuddaula in order to teach the east india company a lesson he marched up to calcutta and he occupied calcutta defeating the british now the madras factory of the east india company they also had their own fort called fort fort st george the one in calcutta was called fort william and the one in madras was called fort st george now the british from madras they sent colonel robert clive to solve this calcutta mess now robert clive came and uh, made pacts secret pacts with key members of sirajuddaula's court he made pacts with mir jafar who was the commander of the army he made pacts with jagat seth who was the financier of the uh, nawab and so on and so forth and many people so all of them entered a conspiracy against sirajuddaula now uh, following this the battle of plassey happened where sirajuddaula lost because mir jafar betrayed him and sirajuddaula fled from the battlefield and later he was caught and he was killed mir jafar was placed on the throne as the new nawab by the east india company now this had an advantage for the company because the company had this vision the company had this mindset that this new nawab who i have placed on the throne is my puppet he will listen to me he will do whatever i tell them tell him to do he will not create any problems for us any more but this actually had a uh, this actually created a problem later on because uh, mir jafar was expected to pay up a huge amount of money to the east india company as compensation for the destruction of their fort now when he was unable to pay up the company removed him and placed mir qasim on the throne 
Now Mir Qasim was told to pay up the money. Now Mir Qasim did not like this. He was like, I am the Nawab and I should work independently. Why do some traders who I barely know, they come and order me? Now Mir Qasim tried to assert his independence from the company's shadow. He made alliance first with the Nawab of Awad and then the Mughal Emperor himself. So together the three armies, the armies of Bengal, the armies of Awad and the armies of the Mughal uh, Emperor, these three combined armies fought against the British East India Company at Buxar in the Battle of Buxar. But unfortunately the British armies won and uh, Mir Qasim was removed from the throne and Mir Jafar was brought back. By the time Mir Jafar returned to the throne, the entire outlook of the company has changed. Now it, it, uh, the company thought that, okay, so the puppet Nawabs are creating problems for me. What if their powers are reduced to such an extent that I will be the actual Nawab of the Bengal presidency? So this they legalized with the help of the Mughal emperor. How? In 1765, the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II, he was forced to sign a treaty with the British called the Treaty of Allahabad, which gained, which, uh, which gave Britain East India Company the power to collect taxes legally from the people of Bengal. That is, they became the governors of the Bengal province legally. Now, what did it mean to be the Nawabs? It meant of course that the company acquired more power and authority than ever. But it also meant something else. Each company servant began to live like Nawabs because they got huge amounts of money from the uh, Nawab of Awadh, from the Nawab of Bengal and also from the Mughal Emperor and also the taxes that were being collected from the people of Bengal. Now after the Battle of Plassey, the actual Nawabs of Bengal were forced to give land and vast sums of money as personal gifts to the company officials. Robert Clive himself amassed a fortune in India. He had come to Madras from England in 1743 at the age of 18. When in 1767 he left India, his fortune was worth almost 400,000 pounds. Interestingly, when he was appointed the governor of Bengal in 1764, he was asked to remove the corruption in company administration. But he was himself cross-examined cross in 1772 by the British Parliament, accused of corruption. Although he was acquitted, he was left alone. In 1774, Robert Clive committed suicide in London. Okay, I am stopping here. We will continue with this chapter in the next video. Till then, bye.